And it is Tuesday, August 13th, 2013. My name is Dale DeFoya, and this is another episode of Athletics Talk Now. We want to welcome you, Ace fans listening on YouTube, iTunes, Lips, and Facebook, Stitcher Radio, and our website, which is athleticstalknow.com. We're a podcast and a blog that celebrates the past and embraces the future of Oakland A's baseball. Search A's Talk Now on Facebook for our fan page, and also iTunes, search Athletics Talk Now for an archive of over 100 podcasts I hosted since 2010, and you can find me on Twitter. I'm at at Dale Tafoya. That's at D-A-L-E-T-A-F-O-Y-A. And on this date in A's history, August 13th, 2005, in fact, the A's retired the number of number 43, <laughs> donned by Hall of Fame closer Dennis Eckersley. In 1992, Eck earned both the AL Cy Young Award and Most Valuable Player Award after recording 51 saves and 54 opportunities. In fact, we were privileged to have Eck on the show recently. And today we have another former A's great pitcher on the show. He was one of my favorite A's pitchers growing up, and I'm thrilled to have him on the show. Steve Ontiveros pitched 10 seasons in the big league starting in 1985, six of them with the A's. He was one of those players who grew up in the A's farm system in the early 80s under the likes of Carl Keel, Keith Lippman, and Grady Fusion. And after a six-year hi- hiatus with the Phillies and Mariners and a few other organizations, He returned to the A's in 1994 and posted a 2.65 ERA, which crowned him the AL ERA champion that season. And if you followed the A's closely during that time, Tony La Russa would also tap him to pinch run on the base pass on a few occasions. He was an all-star in 1995. And and Steve, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, you came up in 85 as a reliever, and by 1995 you were a starting pitcher. Tell our listeners about the 1985 Oakland A's at the time, a team that finished fourth that season with a 77 and 85 record under under then manager Jackie Moore. Right, that rookie year was a great year. It was a fun year, obviously uh, my uh, my first year, and uh, we had some some really uh, um, cagey and, and scrappy veterans on the team. I remember Mike Keith and and uh, Steve McCaddy, you had uh, Dave Kingman, Dusty Baker. Uh, gosh, uh, Collins, uh, who else do we have? Oh, man, Alfredo Griffin. So there was a really a veteran-laden team, laden team, and uh, which was great for me to come into because, you know, a lot of guys took me under their wings, Mike Davis. I mean, we had some really good players. Uh, you know, unfortunately, at that time, we had a lot of guys get hurt, and so, um, you know, their, our production on the field um, was up and down until they got healthy again. But uh, we competed pretty strong. We were five games out going into September. Uh, before you know, the air was let out of our balloon. I, um, I can't even remember one the White Sox or somebody that year, but uh, um, no, it was the Royals. The Royals won it that year. Just been with the World Series, um, so they had a pretty strong team as well. But uh, it was a great, great group of guys that I had a chance to uh, to come up with and uh, and learn from. And um, you know, it was, it was a fun season for me because I had a really great season both in triple a and then get called up to oakland and having a uh, finish up strong and it was a rotation i believe with uh the likes of don sutton and also didn't tommy john uh, sign tommy with john the last month? <laughs> don sutton tommy john boy this is those veterans man that was, that was a really really strong veteran lead team, led uh lead led team and uh it was uh it was a lot of fun love don sutton he actually worked with me i had a pretty good curveball going into it but he showed me a little a little uh, adjustment to it, which made it an unbelievable curveball. It's one I throw today, and it's one I teach today. So, it's uh, he was a great teammate, Tommy John as well. Um, I remember uh, Chris Cotteroli was uh, one of our starters, uh, McCaddy, and he was coming back from an injury. Um, so that was uh, that was a lot of fun that year. Um, as Keith Atherton was uh, was a setup man. Jay Hall was our closer. Um, so it was, it, was a, it was a fun year. And Quality during players. Yeah, during that time, Steve, the A's were producing uh, one of the most talent-laden farm systems in all in baseball under Carl Keel, right. the late Carl Keel. Uh, you, you were drafted in the second round in 1982 from the University of Michigan. Jose Canseco was drafted that same season uh, out of Miami, and McGuire, of course, was the A's first-round pick in '84. Then you had the likes of Terry Steinbach and Stan Javier and Walt Weiss in the farm system. What made that farm system so special, and was it just the high pick, Steve, or was it the A's philosophy and system? 
Well, I think I think you have a combination of everything. Uh, without a doubt, your scouting system is your is your life source for your for your um, for your ball club. If you if you swing and miss on a lot of uh, a lot of talent, then that's going to show up. And and obviously, Grady Grady didn't. He he hit home runs everywhere. So, you know, guys like uh, Don Hill, Mike Gallego. Uh, Kurt Young. I mean, it just goes on and on. All the guys that, in fact, Kurt and Gags are, are actually on the staff there. So uh, sure. um, it goes on and on. Guys, you mentioned, you know, um, Walt Weiss. And Walt was a fantastic, uh, fantastic player. Um, so uh, first and foremost, it's, it was the scouting. And you know, my year, we had uh, Phil Stevens and Charlie O'Brien. Um, so it was pretty strong, pretty strong class. So um, you know, from that, then from there, you uh, you have you know, good coaching and uh, that, 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 that really hasn't established a system at that point like they are, like they do now. Uh, what Carl did back then was he established a strength training program, which no one had at that time. There were a few guys doing it, like, uh, was like Kester, the outfielder for uh, the Angels Downing, I forget his first name. Um, Brian Downing, yeah. Yeah, Brian Downing, yeah. He was one of the few guys that, that was, you know, really hit, uh, hitting the weight, weight room hard and, you know, he looked like a football player out there. And so, uh, Carl instituted that uh, throughout all of the program. You're talking about 155 pound shortstops pushing weights for the first time. Didn't really uh, didn't really excite them, but uh, as they got into it and kept it as a regiment, you know, the 155 turned to 175 pretty quick, and now they could, uh, you know, 162 game season be able to compete and and withstand the, the the vigors of the season. So I think that first and foremost, that was the most important part. Um, what Carl instituted secondly was was he had a he had a uh, an expectation, and uh, and it didn't matter where you were. I was the first pick that year, and uh, and his expectations were you produce, and and uh, you're not going to get coddled, and uh, and he was pretty firm. Nobody really liked Carl because of that. Uh, Carl, uh, you know, turned it to me as a, uh, as the years went by as a really good friend um, and a mentor. Um, he first uh, signed on as a as more of a um, um, sports psychology guy. And I was his pet project. <laughs> so he would travel with me on, on the buses, you know, nine hour bus ride, sit next to me on my chair, and he'd shake my head. And, and, you know, at that time, I thought it was the goofiest thing I'd ever seen or heard or even uh, witnessed. And um, by the time it was said and done, he, you know, he changed my career, my outside of my career, and actually uh, made me a better pitcher. was able to, to overcome a lot of the things that, uh, that was not being able to overcome in the minor leagues as a, uh, from a mental standpoint. So he helped me prepare. Um, for the game from the from the mental stand, uh, point of view and stuff that I that I continue to use and teach today, it's, it, 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 he was probably the most influential uh, person in my in my career. The voice you're hearing is Steve Onaveros, former All Star pitcher for the A's. Steve, tell us about pitching in Oakland, uh, the Oakland Coliseum. You had a career 3.24 ERA there in 89 games. Uh, they had it had huge foul territory, heavy air at night. What are your memories pitching at the Coliseum? Uh, pitcher's paradise. It's one word to describe, or two words to describe. It is, uh, you know, the, all the things that you mentioned uh, favor the pitcher because there's uh, the foul balls that would be fouled in the stands in Boston, you know, which we 30 rows back are caught in front of the dugout in Oakland. Uh, and you had, some, you know, pretty good, you know, McGuire and Carney Lansford, you know, shugging, you know, checking down the lines trying to get these balls and they get to them. So, that's a big deal. Uh, it, it really is. It's, you know, you, you don't have to throw any more pitches. Uh, you've already got an out uh, registered on the board, and you're on to the next hitter. That that is a huge, huge factor in in pitching in Oakland. Everybody loved pitching in Oakland. And then again, as you go into the night games, uh, the the uh, the air uh, gets cooler, gets heavier, and so to hit a hit a home run in, in Oakland in the evenings uh, was quite a task. And and which you know speaks to you know the power that McGuire and all those guys had uh, hit it. Um, you know, out of park then. So, um, so yeah, it was a great place to pitch. Uh, you had high grass, so uh, and a strong defense. So it was, it was a great place to pitch, no question about it. But I think everybody, every pitcher in the league, you know, marked their calendars for for Oakland if they had a chance to pitch. Mm-hmm. And in 1986, Steve, the A's continued to struggle under under Jackie Moore, and here comes yeah. Tony Larusa, whom the White Sox had just fired a month earlier. He brings along his pitching coach, Dave Duncan, and looking back almost 30 years later, they turned out to be a pretty iconic tandem. In fact, the A's finished 45-34 and 34 that season under Tony La Russa. 
How much did Tony's arrival change your role, Steven? And how did Larusa change the direction of that team, who made three consecutive World Series World Series appearances shortly after? Right, that's a good question. And uh, you know, in fairness to Jackie Moore, we had everybody go down: Dwayne Murphy, Mike Davis, Kingman. I mean, everybody who was who could drive in runs, pitchers went down, and it was tough. Um, you know, we were way, way out uh, by All Star break. And and we got everybody back after the All Star break. So I'm credit to, to to Jackie Moore. He put his finger in his back the best he could. Um, and Tony had a pretty good pretty good roster to start from. So um, you know let let the truth be known there. But however, we all know how great a manager Tony Russo was and Dave Duncan was a pitching coach. Uh, the baseball dynamic duo, if you will, they're am- amazing. I mean, you can't do what they did for for as long as they did and have all the have all the uh, hardware they collected over that time without. Uh, given their given them their due and credit, so they they were the uh, amazing amazing uh, mentors teachers. Uh, Tony Russo was the most prepared manager I've ever played for, and I played for a number of them. Um, he was amazing. I mean, he was uh, always two steps ahead of the other manager. And what I loved about Tony is he would walk back and he would pace back and forth in the, in the dugout, and he would explain the situation as it's developing on the field, and then he would tell us what he's going to do. And so it was. It was. Then you just kind of sat back and go, okay, let's see what happens. And I'm telling you, a lot of times, what he what he predicted or what he said he was going to do, and to defend it or to offend it, uh, happened right in front of your eyes. So it was. It was actually. It was actually pretty amazing to be in the dugout at that wow. time. Um, Tony was a very intense individual, um, and uh, and so he, you know, he. Mm, you know, what's the word I want to say? Yeah. Um, he he let you know what your job was and how important it was, and uh, and so if you didn't take what you did seriously, you weren't going to be there. And that was very very clear. And there were a lot of guys that that fell into that those ranks and and they weren't there. You turn turn your head, they were gone. Somebody else was there. And so he set the precedence for that. But mostly, you know, everybody knew what a great manager he was uh, with with Chicago. Why they had two pitching coaches and why they had all that stuff going on over there. Uh, was beyond me, especially after they won the pennant uh, a couple of years before that. It was, sure. it was just, you know, to let him go. Um, so he kind of fell into a great situation. It was a great situation for both sides, Tony and Oakland. And uh, and Tony just set, um, you know, made his set his mark and uh, and and established what he wanted to do and what his expectations were. He was very clear, very clear on what on, on letting you know what your roles are. And as a player. It, um, if you know what your job is, whether it's a, a large portion of the pie or a small portion of the pie, if you know exactly what your job is, uh, you can focus on that and and, uh, and and really hone in on what your job is. And so, um, when he came to me, uh, he's one to turn me, uh, move me into the rotation. Um, at that time, I threw four pitches, and um, and my first hundred games uh, in the big leagues was as a reliever. And so, my hundred first game was a starter. And uh, that month, I won the uh, American League Pitcher of the Month. Um, sure. So uh, he was able to, uh, you know, give me a little confidence, give me an idea of, of you know, uh, pitching beyond the, you know, one or two or three innings I was pitching. So, uh, and Dunk was it was a, was amazing. Um, I, I don't think there's anybody who's ever taught me more than Dave Duncan. Not so much. Dave Duncan wasn't a techniques guy. He wasn't a mechanics guy. He was a uh, preparing you for each hitter guy. How do I how do I um, pitch to this guy? How do I prepare for this guy? And so when we have our scouting reports, it was it was basically going to school. Because Dunk at that time had all the information on everybody, and there weren't computers back then. I mean, it was it was all done by hand. And he pulled out his his notebooks, which looked like a you know an encyclopedia binder of every team. And he'd give you uh, the counts, he'd give you the pitches, he'd give you the the spray chart of where it went. So you had all the information at your fingertips. At his fingertips, and we go and be inning by inning, by, uh, hitter by hitter, and, and uh, prepare you for each at bat. It was it was uh, an incredible learning experience. Mm-hmm. And of course, the A's uh, pitching coach now is Kurt Young. So you're saying uh, Dave Duncan's uh, legacy and his uh, his his fingerprint is still uh, he, he has it still on the A's with Kurt Young, the hit pitching coach there. Oh, sure he does. You know, um, Kurt's a good friend of mine. We came up through Myers, and, and we're both from Michigan, the state of Michigan, and so we've. 
we've been buddies forever. And Kurt, uh, Kurt's always been a student of the game, and uh, Doc has a lot of influence on a lot of guys. Mm-hmm. You know, you think of Rick Honeycutt down in uh, with right. the Dodgers. You know, Dave Stewart for years as a pitching coach, and and now in the was in the general man- or in the management aspect of it. Uh, Bobby Welch has done some uh, some work as well. So. Um, you know, I was a, I actually did some work for the uh, Olympics in uh, in in '08, so I uh, got a chance to run the China Olympic team. So uh, there's a lot of lot of guys who who come under his uh, under his wing and and uh, you know um, establishing his legacy. Mm-hmm. And you know, Steve, one of the most talent p- talented pitchers I've seen uh, growing up uh, was Jose Rio, who came uh, yeah, o- <laughs> Oakland in in the Ricky Henderson trade in '84. Uh, in one game, in fact, I believe in 1986 at age 20, he struck out 16 Seattle Mariner batters. Mariners. Yeah, mm-hmm. he ended up having a 14-year career uh, and haunted the A's eventually in the 1990 World Series with the Reds. What do you remember yeah, most sucked. about <laughs> fireballer Jose Rio? Uh, Jose was uh, about a uh, – uh, um, he was just a kid in the candy store. Um, every day the kid came home, came in with a smile on his mouth and nothing but, but, uh, unbelievable positive attitude all the time. It, he was a joy to be around. Uh, I, you don't see many guys like him, uh, and because baseball is such a grind and it's so intense and so, and it's so serious. And he just brought, uh, you know, so much, uh, lightness to the room. It wasn't, you know, uh, he's always a fun guy to hang around and laugh with. Um, but he did have great stuff. He had a you know a great fastball. At, at that time, he was throwing you know back then ninety three ninety four was really hard. Mm-hmm. <laughs> now it's like people warm up throwing that hard. But back then, you know if, in eighty six eighty five eighty six that ball that fastball was was really hard, and he had a great slider to go with it. Mm-hmm. And uh, the only challenge that Hosey had was uh, was finding the strike zone. And so when he was around the strike zone, he was pretty much unhittable. Um, and then you know when he didn't. You know, you just can't, and you're starting look, trying to find the uh, find the strike zone. You start throwing a lot of fastballs, and here's you know they catch up to you, and bad things happen. So when he was around the strike zone, like he was that night in Seattle, it was ugly. It was ugly for the other team. And then uh, he went to Cincinnati, um, and uh, clicked, and then just had a great career over there. So um, yeah, he was a great guy. Uh, <laughs> it's funny you mention him because uh, you know you kind of forget about some of the some of the guys you played with, but. Uh, he was he was a joy to play with. Mm-hmm. And of course, Steve, in 1985, 86, 87, you start to witness the arrival of some of the phenoms. Jose Canseco and Mark McGuire both were obliterating Triple A Tacoma. Jose came up came up in September of 85. Big Mac came up in August of 86. They ended up as one of the most dominant home run tandems in all of baseball in the late 80s, uh, the Bash Brothers. Uh, with all the steroid drama that had transpired since then, Steve, even a visit to Congress uh, thirty years later. What what goes goes through your mind when you uh, remember your former former teammates who were engulfed in that controversy? Uh, you know, obviously they're not great memories. Uh, when you have to when you put it in that uh, context, uh, it's such a black eye. Um, and I'm glad the players uh, right now are really are really uh, stepping out and stepping and, and uh, saying you know whatever they can against it and and. You know, to the point now where they're tired of it. Don't do it because you know we ain't gonna protect you, and and it should be that way. Um, it's cheating. We all know it is. You can't you can't do what that what they did and and produce that kind those kind of numbers, um, and 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 know that has not a, a affected the game of baseball. Um, now, the thing about Mac in his rookie year, um, his rookie or first full year, was. Uh, he was still, and he, and I, and I truly firmly believe that he was not uh, involved with that. Uh, he had 49 home runs his rookie year, mm-hmm. and um, you know we called him Marco Solo because uh, a lot of his home runs were solo that year. Of the 49, it was amazing how many solo home runs he hit. Right. But if if you look at him, we used to walk around the locker room, some of the guys, locker, and they take out his uniform and hang it on a metal hanger, and then they would bend the hangers down because he had sloping shoulders. And he, they'd somebody would walk around the clubhouse going, "Hey, player quiz." <laughs> they they parade that uh, that jersey with the sloped shoulders because you know uh, Mac wasn't that wasn't built out at that time, <laughs> and uh, and and he just had a great swing and a great eye. He really had good command of the strike zone, and so uh, he would hit his 49 homers. He would hit them, you know, four or five feet over the fence. Conseco would hit his 50 feet over the fence. 
And that was the difference between Jose and Mac. Mac hit more of them. Jose hit them farther. Hmm. And then you started seeing the distance. Mac started putting on the ball, and all of a sudden you see his body change. And and um, and there was no doubt at that at that point what was going on. And you know you know it was kind of the, you know keep to yourself time uh, type of uh, uh, era. So um, you know they're not they're not fond memories of going back, going you know what they did. You know affected. You know their numbers, and uh, but as far as uh, people and individual, uh, Jose is Jose. He, what you see in the media is is how he is. Uh, Mac, Mac was a extremely polite, gentle, uh, great teammate, um, uh, guy that you would you would you know uh, defend and, and and go to go to bat for. He was, he was an amazing teammate, good friend. Um, and uh, you know, it's just sad to see that he was he was uh, tied up in that because he really didn't need it. I mean, that's how good his swing was. Right. And get, getting back to your career, Steve, uh, you signed with the Phillies in February of 1989 and have some arm problems, and and you kind right. of bounced from Detroit, Minnesota, and Seattle those organizations, and then you signed back with the A's in 1994 and become the AL ERA champion. Tell us about those setbacks during that time and your resurgence in 1994, 95, when you become an all-star. Yeah, you know, it's obviously a, a tough, a tough uh, time in my career. Um, you know, when I was always on the field and I was healthy, you know, I put up some pretty, pretty staggering numbers. And uh, the challenge for me was, uh, was uh, you know, staying uh, off the DL. And um, you know, at that time, you know, I had, a, I had. A, um, a ligament in my elbow that was uh, not uh, complying with my uh, with my purposes and my job and it very well. So um, back in that day, um, it was a lot different. Like you know, you said, uh, uh, I was you know the, the second round pick. I signed for thirty seven thousand five hundred, and I you know I was the highest paid of, of all the draft choices. And uh, you know, there's not a lot of that. There's not a lot of money invested in the draft choices back then. So it was just a different time. Um, you know, if they have got you know six million tied into you, they're gonna they're gonna be a little bit more cautious with you. Gonna make sure that uh, that you know back when we when we played and when I came in, if you had a boo boo or something that that bothered you, you just you know spit on it, rub dirt on it, and go get them. And uh, a lot of times, you know that, that's that's great. You can work through it. And a lot of times, it just um, you know just complicates the matters. And unfortunately, I continued to do that. My body was telling me to stop. And I was saying no, and I just kept going, and and it just battled this thing on and off, and finally, uh, you know, after uh, 88 season, during the 88 season, they they realized that it wasn't tendonitis. I had uh, I had damaged my ligament, so I'm pitching on this stuff with, for two years, on and off, and uh, it was it was not a fun time. The two years that I was healthy to, um, prior to that surgery, man, I I, I pitched great, and. Then, the times that it didn't hurt, it didn't. It hurt like crap, and I pitched like it. So, um, eventually, I had the surgery. Went to Philly, started off the season amazing. I was leading. I was at a point nine ERA, leading the league at that time. And uh, and then the surgery that I had failed. Um, it was a kind of a. Uh, I forgot about it. It was kind of a. Um, a band-aid approach to it. Hopefully, you know, Bryn Smith had gone through it and was successful. Um, and uh, unfortunately, mine didn't make it, so I ended up having a full Tommy John in '89. Um, and then that was the time you mentioned with the Tigers and the Twins and everything else. That was more trying to battle through that surgery and trying to get my arm uh, healthy. And even that was a, was a tough deal. So finally, in '80, you know, in '80 was I got picked up in '83 or '93 um, with the Twins. Uh, my arm was wonderful, felt mm. unbelievable, and I was. Kick and tail in AAA. I was at a, I had a lead league at ERA in July with a one, one point zero in the PCL, which is like ridiculous. And so um, I ended up getting called up or traded to the Mariners, uh, pitched in the Mariners, and finished with a one ERA there, ironically. And uh, um, and then Oakland picked me up as free agent that year, uh, the next season. And then uh, and then I won the ERA title. So um, I had to, it was interesting. I had, to, I would went in as a reliever again with Tony and Duncan there. And I was, I was battling a lot of guys. Uh, uh, Kelly Downs was one of them. Mm-hmm. You know, we picked up Eckersley later. Um, so my job was basically, uh, beating out Kelly Downs and he had a, a million dollars guaranteed. Mm-hmm. 
And we all had amazing spring trainings. Kelly had a good spring training. I had a good spring training. All our pitchers, Darling and Welchy and uh, all these guys had great spring trainings. And um, so it was, I'm, I'm thinking, well, I'm triple A bound because <laughs> they're going to eat a million. Mm-hmm. And uh, sure enough, they, uh, they signed me on the last day of spring training. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I started the season as a reliever um, and uh, pitched okay, not great. Um, you know, I, I, I pitched like amazing and then for you know, one out of the inning, give up a run or something. So I was always you know battling that, and then he, uh, and uh, Dave Stewart got hurt, and uh, so I took his spot in rotation, and uh, and then just this went off. I had an amazing season that year, and I was healthy. I felt great. You know, all my pitches were working. Um, I was going deep into every game. It was uh, it was a uh, it was a fun time. Like what I could do when I was healthy. So that's how that turned out. And the ninety uh, next year, same thing. Led into that year it was. Uh, Picked on the All Star team, I was third in the league in ERA and wins, and uh, and then my arm went south right after the All Star game. Mm, a nice ten year career, and and tell us about uh, Steve the the camaraderie that uh, that retired players have. I know uh, when they retire the game, some coach, some get away from baseball altogether. How do retired pl- retired players communicate, or is it or is it just a matter if if we lie? like you as a team teammate, then I'm gonna continue to you know like you when you retire as well. How does that go for for a big leaguer? Well, you know, you, you played with so many guys over the years. There's so, there's hundreds of guys that that you were friends with and played with, and and uh, you know, spring training is the hardest time because that's when everybody comes together. So spring training is a tough tough month and a half for me. Um, you know, because uh, I miss that part of it, that camaraderie part of it. Um, you know, the good friends you stay in contact with, basically, if they if they live close to you, um, you might go on hunting trips or you know vacations with them or something like that. But um, pretty much everybody's to, uh, each is, is to their own thing they're doing. If they're currently in, involved in, in in professional organizations, they're they're doing that, and you know they're gone for the summer, that type of thing. But uh, um, just you know, I would imagine the ones that uh, my in my relations, the ones that uh, we stay closest to, are the ones that live closest to you because you can see them and you can go golfing with them or, uh, and things like that. But uh, you know, everybody you once you once you leave, you're pretty much your own your own person, and you got to you know fend for your family and and go from there. But uh, you know, every now and again, we get phone calls and and uh, and emails. But um, you know, uh, that's basically how it goes. Hmm. Last last uh, question. Uh, I'm going to throw a few names out uh, for you, Steve, and I want you to sure. tell us what comes to mind when you when you remember these former teammates. Uh, the right. first one is Carney Lansford, uh, gamer. Oh man, that guy's uh, that guy was intense. Um, uh, he was very serious about what he did, and he was very good at what he did, and uh, and a, and a leader. And he expected you to do your job. If you did not do your job, he let you know about it. And uh, which is what leaders should do. Um, that shouldn't be Tony's job. If, if, it, if it gets to Tony, then then you really let it slack. You know, you're, that this that kind of stuff needs to be be policed by players. And he was the leader of the team, and and uh, and so those two qualities, you know, leader and gamer, um, amazing amazing player. Uh, the next one will be Dave Kingman. I love Kinger. Um, gosh, how could I do? Yeah, there's so many things. Uh, he is uh, eccentric. Hmm. Um, he is. Uh, he's actually very kind. Mm-hmm. Very kind. Um, I had a great relationship with him and his wife and, and our wives. We were. He was just a fun teammate. He's very funny. Uh, what you saw in the press was not what we saw in at the clubhouse. He was hmm. very funny. He was a, he was a practical jokester. Um, uh, very. Uh, very. He was he was often viewed as aloof outside of the uh, from the media. He was definitely not aloof. Um, he was he was odd, no question. But he was but he was definitely uh, focused and intent on on what he did as a baseball player. Um, great teammate, loved him. Hmm. Uh, Dwayne Murphy, Captain Murph. Murph. <laughs> oh, he's um, I have nothing but nothing but accolades to say about Murph. Uh, great center fielder. Uh, when I went to Philly, he was there uh, with me in Philly, so uh, got to hang with him there too, and get to run a lot of my mistakes down. So, um, great teammate, uh, very quiet uh, individual, um, but uh, he did his work on the on the field. Um, I have a, I have a, we have a saying uh, that I have for my youth baseball teams I trained that we have a, a helmet sticker, and that's uh, and the helmet sticker is named in honor of Murph, and we call it Murphy's Law. 
Mm. And what Murph did is he took the most hellacious cuts I've ever seen anybody take. So we would we would say uh, for Murph for Murphy's Law, the helmet sticker is to swing hard in case you hit it. And because uh, when he hit it, it you know, back he was hitting 30 home runs back when nobody was hitting 30 runs, 30 home runs. So um, he just took an amazing cut at the ball. Uh, great center fielder, great teammate, um, another great friend. Love that guy. Mm. What about Mike Heath, ace former catcher? Ooh, that guy was intense. Man, he was intense. Um, you didn't want to get on Mike's bad side because he, he was like a hockey player, man. He'd go right out. He'd drop the mask and go right after you. Um, I liked having him on my teams. Uh, he was very intense. Good player, man. Strong arm, good catcher. Um, you know, we had a lot of young catchers at that time. We had Mickey uh, Tattleton, Charlie O'Brien coming up, and, and, uh, and so... Um, they decided to start moving the younger guys in and, and moved into Detroit. Um, but I love Heathy. He was, he was fantastic. You know, he was an old veteran, KG veteran that, uh, was, was, uh, you know, the man commanded respect and, and got it. Um, but he was very intense individual, uh, game day. Um, he was out there, he was going to war and that's, that's the kind of mentality he had. Um, great teammate. Thanks for hanging out with us, Steve. Uh, tell our listeners, uh, what, what you're up to these days. Yeah, well, I've been doing uh, after uh, after I retired, I opened a, a baseball academy, um, and um, so that's been going on. I have that for about ten years now. I've got uh, I've got a number of kids I've got trained that have, uh, have uh, reached major league, so that's pretty pretty cool. Um, actually, I had two guys pitch against each other uh, uh-huh. this year: uh, Houston Street and uh, Charles Brewer, and the Diamondbacks played mm-hmm. the uh, played the Padres. So that was pretty cool, I thought. Um, and uh, so I, I run an academy down here in Scottsdale, Arizona. And I've uh, been doing it for 10 years, had a lot of success, uh, got a lot of kids with D1 scholarships and a lot of guys drafted. So um, we're right in the middle of starting our seasons now as the fall seasons come on and schools come on. So I'm one busy dude right now. Uh, hopefully that will lighten up as uh, as we get into the seasons and, and actually playing games. But uh, doing that, I uh, love doing it, love coaching, <laughs> love teaching. And, you know, um, I'm thinking about um, – after this off season, start contacting some general managers and um, and uh, talk to them about what I do and uh, what I do, what I would do best for a major league organization is nice. take a guy who's been, who's been struggling or a guy who's got great stuff but you can't figure out why he can't get anybody out. Um, guys who you think, man, if he had another pitch to throw, um, if he could master you know another pitch, you know, give me those guys. And uh, and I'll turn them around. That's what I do. And so uh, so I'm going to approach a number of guys. I've got a I've got uh, eight guys I put in the big leagues uh, or help get in the big leagues. Um, you know, Ismail Valdez was my first client, mm-hmm. and uh, he was uh, really struggling. Uh, he had about I don't know probably ten years in the big leagues at that time. He was on the verge of getting released because he was pitching terribly. Uh, he lost the movement on his fastball. Had no breaking ball. And those aren't great combinations as a pitcher, by the way. So, <laughs> so my agent was his agent, and he sent it to me. And uh, you know, I added three more pitches to his repertoire. He ended up winning 15 games that year. So, uh, so I was really uh, that kind of you know started my niche of what I do with uh, with some of the more talented players. So, uh, it's pretty cool. That's Steve Onavero, Sam Diotafoya. Steve, thanks you for joining the podcast, and thank you for creating so many memories for A's fans uh, to reflect and celebrate. Well, I appreciate it. Thanks for calling me, and uh, it was great coming down memory lane. I appreciate that. No problem.